you're about to move. I feel it in the wind we're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So like the rain come drenched us in your glory rushing like a flood and we are fixed on this one thing to know your goodness see your glory yeah we transform by this one thing to know your presence see your beauty devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been Faithful you will be, you pledge yourself to me, and 
and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. kindness makes us whole you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you you're clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride free from all her guilt and rid of all her shame by her true name and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my
what is going on, VCA Church? A few announcements for you, then we're going to jump into our study of the Bible together. Every Saturday night, 6.30 p.m., we have live worship and preaching out front in the VCA Church parking lot. We have kids' ministries going on. We have youth group going on Saturday nights at 6.30. It's awesome. Now that daylight savings has come, we're out under the stars. We got some lights out. It's a time to remember, a very special time. So join us Saturdays at 6.30 or Sundays we're meeting at 8.30 in the morning and we have our worship and our preaching. We have kids' ministry as well as, at that time. And so Saturdays 6.30, Sundays at 8.30 in the morning, and it's a special time of worship, a powerful time of worship. And we space out best we can. We're outside in the fresh air. And at some point, we're going to add a 1030 service. So keep that in the back of your mind, but not yet. Every Wednesday, 630 p.m., we pray. Uh, and we pray together via the live stream. So YouTube, you can go to YouTube.com, type in Valley Christian Assembly anytime after 630. Watch it, get your prayer requests in. Uh, you can also email your prayer request to mark at vcachurch.com. If you don't know where to find any of this stuff, you can always just go to the church website, vcachurch.com. And it's important that we keep our souls filled with the good stuff. There's so much anxiety out there. There's so much anger out there that sometimes we can let our hearts drift. Keep filling your heart and your mind with the good stuff of God's word. At vcachurch.com, there is new content every single day of the week just for you. We also have a couple podcasts, Brokenness to Faith, and my podcast is the We Carry the Fire podcast. Our most recent, uh, one of our most recent, is a new study in the life of Jonah. Jonah's more than a guy who got swallowed by a fish, right? There's a lot of context going on there. And the most recent one we did is God doesn't want to replace you. He wants to repair you. Jonah was struggling with isolation. He was struggling with depression. He was struggling with rebellion. A lot of the things that are rattling around in our hearts right now. And yet God did not give up on Jonah and he's not giving up on you. Go listen to it at We Carry the Fire podcast, all podcasting platforms, as well as our church website. And we're going to keep on overcoming together. Amen. Well, hey, today we got Build Strong part Four. So if you've been following this series, this is part four. If not, I'll get you caught up, but I would encourage you to go back and listen to part one, two, and three. We're going to keep on marching through the book of Nehemiah together. Incredibly inspirational. Just a little bit of context as we jump into our sermon, which is entitled, Questions That Backfire For Your Benefit. Questions That Backfire For Your Benefit. Don't you just love it when someone tries to rub it in your face or tell you they told you so and then it all backfires? Like when the wife says, you had the keys last and suddenly they emerge from her purse. Don't you just love it? Just a little bit of that backfiring mentality. Well, we're going to look at some questions that backfired for the benefit of God's people. And these same questions and challenges are asked of us today. And God's going to keep on turning the tables to keep his people living in victory. Context of the book of Nehemiah, as you turn to chapter 4, uh, just a little bit of context. The people of Israel had been defeated by the Assyrians, and they had been taken away. And then the Assyrians had been overwhelmed by the Persians. And at some point, a few decades before our text, King Cyrus had let Ezra go rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been taken away captive. The people had been taken away and he released them to go rebuild their temple and reinstitute worship. And it was challenging, it was difficult, but God helped them every step of the way, and they rebuilt that temple, and they reinstituted their worship there in Jerusalem. Now fast forward a few decades, and we come to Nehemiah. He is the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes in the Persian Empire, 900 miles away from Jerusalem. He talks to one of his fellow brothers from Jerusalem. He says, how are things going? And he says, the walls are down. We are in danger and we are in dishonor. Nehemiah's heart breaks and he doesn't know how he's going to react or what he can even do as an exile 900 miles away. But God's gracious hand was upon him and favoring him every step of the way. And to make a long story, three sermons long story short, God granted Nehemiah everything he needed, the permits and all the materials needed to rebuild and safe passage to Jerusalem. And then the last time we studied together, 
It was that moment of truth when Nehemiah would see if the people would rally behind him to rebuild these walls, and indeed, they did. And so we're on part four. Part one was when walls break, how do we respond? When God calls you, he equips you. That was part two. Part three was actually how to get started. When it's time to actually pick up that first brick, sometimes getting started is difficult. And today we're going to talk about questions that backfire for your benefit. As we look at the temple in Jerusalem, that is a picture of our faith. When Ezra and Zerubbabel rebuilt that temple, that is a picture of you and I coming to faith. There's a prophetic picture there. That's where we come to spiritual life and we have a heart to worship as they had a heart to restore worship in Jerusalem. And the walls around the city are a prophetic picture of our spiritual strength. And when our walls break down, our strength breaks down, we are in danger and there is dishonor and we need to rebuild that strength. So we're talking about building strong here we are, part four, questions that backfire for our benefit. I saw a funny example of that this week. I read an article. It actually took place back in 1870, early 1870s, when there was an editor for the New York Herald newspaper who really was annoyed and aggravated at the, uh, the zoo there in Central Park. He felt like they weren't operating safely, and he wanted to put that on display for everyone to see and embarrass them so they would have to change their ways. However, it backfired a little bit. I want to read you a little bit of this article, and Derek's going to post uh, the headline, or the actual the page from the newspaper uh, of what they printed up there. And so as you look at this picture on your screen, I'll read you some of uh, this story about this article. He's trying to zing them. He's trying to put them down for being irresponsible. He wants them to be put on display for their incompetence. So, after a leopard nearly escaped from the Central Park Zoo in the 1870s, New York Herald editor Thomas Connery decided to expose the zoo's dangerous practices. Sure, he could have just written a boring, straightforward editorial on the subject, but that doesn't sell newspapers. So rather than simply calling out the zookeepers for being bad at their jobs, so bad that they couldn't even transfer an animal between cages without making passerbys fear for their lives, Connery asked his writers to create a fake front page story warning New York's 1.4 million citizens that an army of wild animals had escaped from the zoo and had already killed 49 people and were coming quickly to murder the rest of the city. Do you see how this plan could backfire? A front page article saying that the animals had escaped and were running wild in the city. Now in the last paragraph it explained that none of this was true and that it was all just to for show of what could be if the zoo doesn't get their act together. However, how many people do you think read the last paragraph of that article? Not many. The joke was picked up by approximately no one, as most of the readers were far too busy loading their weapons and retrieving their kids from school to bother reading the rest of the article. By all accounts, the article caused widespread panic through the city. Armed men rushed into the streets ready to defend their homes. Reporters were dispatched to cover the story. Police mobilized. Parents rushed to bring their children home from school. In a follow-up story, the New York Times, another newspaper, printed letters from readers who genuinely feared for their safety on account of this article. On one related note, Connery later claimed in the publication that the editor of the Times himself ran out of his home waving pistols in the air ready to shoot the first animal he had encountered while several more bitter victims went a step further, marching to the district attorney's office, demanding that the Herald pay for their deception. As far as we know, they paid nothing. So here was the Herald trying to smear the zoo with this fake article, and it totally backfired as people in the whole city went into panic mode, and what was put on display was the incompetence of the Herald rather than the incompetence of the zoo. Well, let's read this together in chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, now when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious and he was filled with indignation. He ridiculed the Jews before his associates and the army of Samaria, saying, what are these feeble Jews doing? Can they restore this wall all by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of the rubble? So we see a lot of questions there. 
And we face questions as we try to build spiritual strength, as we try to raise our families. Sometimes the questions come from outside, outside sources, the enemy, or those who are discouraging, discouraging voices trying to bring us down. But many times it seems that the biggest questions gnawing away at us, whether we can do it or not, come from within ourselves. But nonetheless, if we walk with Jesus, all these questions that are meant to tear us down will actually backfire for our benefit. Here's the first question we see, and there's going to be four of them in the little bonus round at the end. Question number one, do they think they can build this wall with all of us surrounding them? Do they think they can build this wall while surrounded by enemies? Let me explain. The question that we can see in the text, can they build this by themselves and can they do this in a day? They ask those two questions. And what, the, the, what he is driving at, what Sandy there is driving at, is these are actually veiled threats. The thought behind these comments, are they able to build this fast enough because they are surrounded by enemies and they're all alone to do it? Can they really build these walls with all of us around while all of the opposition surrounds them? He also mocks them. He calls them feeble. Did Nehemiah actually think he could build these walls while surrounded by his opponents? The opponents thought no. But the actual answer is yes. Yes, Nehemiah believed they could build these walls even while surrounded by the enemies. How can that apply to you? What are you up against? As you're trying to build spiritual strength in your life and in your family, you may be surrounded by some opposition as well. What is threatening to stop you from building strength? What are you surrounded by? Health struggles, financial struggles, past sin and consequences, abuse, dysfunction, fill in the blank. What is it that's around you? Maybe a bunch of these things are surrounding you while you're trying to build strength in your life. What areas in your life would the enemy call you feeble? Do you think that you can build a strong spiritual life? With all of these enemies surrounding you? The enemy assumes the answer is no, you can't. But I want to tell you today, the answer is yes, you can. You can build strength even while surrounded by enemies and opponents and voices trying to pull you down. We see it all through the scripture. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says this, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You can overcome, even while surrounded by the opponent. Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord. In other words, some trust in the power of man, but we have something higher that we trust in. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 12 through 13. Those who wage war against you, will come to nothing. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and tells you, do not fear, I will help you. Even in war and surrounded by the enemy, you can build a strong spiritual life. Even while battling those forces, those things that look like they're going to take you down, God says, when you go into battle, I will hold your right hand. Don't be afraid, I will help you. How about this one? 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who overcomes? Pastors or missionaries or intercessors, prayer warriors. Absolutely, check all those boxes. But it says everyone who is born of God, everyone who is born of God overcomes. Church, you can overcome. You can overcome this question even when they say, do you think you can build spiritual strength even while surrounded by addiction, even while surrounded by family brokenness, even while surrounded by marital failure, even while surrounded by loss of a job or loss of your health? You think you can build spiritual strength and the enemy is asking that question and maybe you're asking that question assuming the answer is no, I can't. But I want to tell you today, for Nehemiah, they said, yes, we can Actually, it's funny you should ask, because yes, we can build even while you surround us. And church, you can build spiritual strength even while surrounded by darkness. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, 
But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Christ Jesus. The victory is in our faith in God. We can overcome. I came across a story of a girl born in Vietnam in the late uh, 1960s. So right in the midst of all this chaos going on in Vietnam, she was abandoned as little more than an infant, just a toddler, abandoned by her parents in the streets, left to fend for herself, having a few days where she'd have to find her own food and her own shelter, completely alone in a war-torn village, all by herself, till she was found and rescued by a Christian organization. Her name was Kelly. And so she's brought in and she overcomes that situation but there's still war going on and the United States of America was allowing this organization to bring children who were abandoned and left and they didn't know where to go or what to do to the United States to be adopted by American families. And so she finally gets word that she can get on this plane and even as this little girl, they put her on this plane and guess what happens to the plane? It crashes. She survives abandonment. She survives the plane crash. And she finally is found and rescued again and brought to the United States of America. And a, and a couple uh, from Seattle adopted her here in the United States of America. And then before she turns 10 years old, she's diagnosed with leukemia. She has to survive and overcome war, abandonment, a plane crash, and now leukemia all before the age of 10. And she overcame every single one of them and grew to be a successful and healthy, happy adult. And she said this, These obstacles that happened in my life gave me strength, fueled my motivation to succeed and go on. She was rescued by that Christian organization, and from there her life just blossomed, challenge after challenge, surrounded by things trying to tear her down, war, abandonment, crashing uh, disease, yet she still builds strength in her life. The enemy wants to say, do you think you can build spiritual strength while all of us are surrounding you? Do you really think so? They thought the answer would be no, but it backfired, and the answer was a resounding Yes, we can. And church, you can as well. Christian, you can as well. Build spiritual strength even while surrounding forces are seeking to tear you down. You can build those strong walls, that spiritual strength. Question number two. I love this one. Do they think their worship will get this wall built? They say, do you think that them offering sacrifices will get this done? And, and let me explain again. Sandwich between can they do this by themselves? And can they do this in a day? We have those two veiled threats. Can they do this all by themselves with all of us out here? Can they do this in a day, meaning they better get this wall up quick because we're going to close in on them and take them down if these walls aren't up in a day or two? So there's threats there. And right between those two questions, they ask, Sandy asks, are they going to offer sacrifices? And what most uh, analysts and theologians say is this was their way of saying this, they need a miracle. They better start sacrificing to their God because if they think they can build this wall before we can organize and close in on them, they're going to need an act of God. Maybe they think that if they worship God, they'll win. Maybe they think that if they worship God with their sacrifices, they'll get this wall built before we can close in on them. Do they really think that they will win by worshiping when we have swords and spears and we have more people than they do and their walls are down? Do they really, really think that they alone, surrounded by enemies, will be able to build this wall impossibly fast, so fast it's impossible. Do they think that their prayers and their worship will accomplish this task? Yeah. Do you guys really think that? The enemy assumed the answer would be no. But again, the answer was a resounding yes. We do believe that our worship will get this wall built. We do believe that our sacrifice and our honor and our worship to God will build this wall. The enemy assumed the answer would be discouraging and no, but the answer was an encouraging yes for Nehemiah and the people within Jerusalem. And the answer for you and I, 
Do you think that worship is going to overcome all your obstacles? Do you think that worship is going to get you through that health crisis? Do you think that worship is going to get you through this financial crisis? Do you think that worship is going to bring your broken relationships back together? Do you think that worship is going to accomplish uh, overcoming emotional disorders and stress? Do you think that worship is going to build strength in your life? The enemy thought the answer would be no. But I tell you today, the answer is yes, we do believe that. Will you build strength through worship? When Job lost everything in chapter 1 of the book of Job, in verses 20 and 21, the scripture says, When all was gone, he ripped his garments, he fell to the ground, and he worshipped. And what did he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. It was worship. When Job needed strength, he went to worship. And Judah, when they were being invaded by Amnon, and Moab, in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 22, they're being invaded, and here's what the scripture says. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Amnon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. As the people of God began to worship the Lord caused ambushes and chaos among the enemy and they were defeated. It was their worship that won the day. And we get this song and Danielle sang it before this sermon. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles, right? That's where this, that song comes from. This is how I fight my battles. And now you know why I'm not on the worship team. But this is how I fight my battles. How is that? Worship. Do you think worship's going to build these walls? Yes, I do. Oh, backfired. Questions that backfire for your benefit. Number one, do you think you can rebuild these walls with all of these enemies around? Yes, I do. Do you really think that your worship is going to help you build these walls? Yes, I do. Wow, these questions of Sandy are just backfiring left and right. And there may be nothing more important for you and I to do than to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. You know, many scriptures, uh, God promises to fight your battles for you. He's been doing it for his people throughout all of time. Exodus 14, verse 14, a good one. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. There was a time when I read Joshua verse, chapter 10, verse 25, one morning in my devotions says, the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. You be strong and you be brave. I read that in my morning devotions. And that very day, I had to go track someone down. I was a youth pastor at the time. And I had to go track someone down. They said, hey, go find so-and-so. So I went to the house and they said, oh, they're not at this house. They're at that other house. So I went to that other house. And when I knocked on the door, there was kind of a kerfuffle. I don't use that word very often. Uh, there was some kind of random noise going on. You think, oh, that's not normal. A lot of kind of shuffling around inside. And finally, someone cracked the door open, and it was someone I'd never seen before. It was a young man, maybe in his 20s. There were two other young men with him, also in their 20s. And as I kind of saw behind them, there were a few girls from our youth group at the time who were in junior high who were utterly passed out. And I quickly put together that these three adult men had very bad intentions for a few passed out young ladies. And I kind of somewhat forced my way and I just sort of walked past them. I said, hey, what's going on here? And uh, the person I was there for was passed out in a bathtub in the back room. And I said, hey, I know they're here and I need to, what's going on here? And these three guys got in my face. They were cursing me out. They were saying, we're gonna mess you up, except different word than mess, also had four letters. Uh, Who do you think you are coming into this house? And I said, hey, I'm just, I, this, this isn't right. I'm taking these people as before the days. Like, I don't remember if I had a cell phone at the time, but I was going to get all of these people home, talk to their parents, and call the police. And I went into the bathroom to pull the one person out, and these three uh, young men came and cornered me in the bathroom, saying they're going to hurt me, they're going to kill me, they're going to break my face. And they were all in my face in this closed area, and it was me, one against three. And you know what came to my mind? What I had read that morning in my scripture. The Lord will fight for you. Only be brave. Be strong. They're barking at me all in my face. 
saying how much they're going to hurt me, what am I doing here, what right do I have, all of this stuff. I didn't say a word. I just stood there. Kind of waiting for the first punch to be thrown or someone to do something, but all they did was bark. And I just, Joshua 10, 25, in my head, over and over again, I just read this. I remember thinking, I just read this. The Lord will fight for you. They approached me once in the living room. They approached me once in the bathroom as I was bringing kid after kid out to the van and putting them in the van to get them out of that terrible situation. And then a third time I had to go in and get the last kid that I was bringing out. And the third time they got in my face and they were barking in my face. And it was like three times they got in my face saying how much they were going to hurt me, how I had no right, who do I think I am. They're going to mess me up, yet they never touched me. And the whole time I kept thinking, the Lord will fight for you. I just read it that morning in my devotion. I had no one there to help me. I had no backup. I was completely and utterly cornered. It was three against one. If it were to go to a throwdown, they probably would have won. I said nothing. Except right at the end, I threw some one-liner in there. Something like they're barking at me and barking at me. I said, hey man, if you're going to do something, do it already or leave me alone. And when I said that, one of the, the, the people that I knew that was getting out of there who was like half drunk, they kind of looked at me like, Matt, don't, don't, because they knew that's asking for trouble. The one line I barked, I had to get a one-liner or a zinger in there somehow. I would have been better off without it. Long story short, the moral of the story, I read this verse that morning, and as they were barking threats at me, and they had all the advantages in the world, all I thought in my mind, the Lord will fight for you. And that verse will forever be etched in my heart, because that day, it was true. The most important thing we can do is worship. Exodus chapter 23, verse 25. Worship the Lord your God, and His blessings will be on your food and on your water. He will take sickness away from among you. All about worship. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the food fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Talk about recession or depression. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God and in my Savior. And then in verse 17, he goes on to say, and he will cause me to walk upon new heights. No grapes in the vineyard, no crops in the field, no animals in the barn. We have nothing left but I will keep worshiping the Lord and He will cause me to walk upon new heights. Some of us need some new heights. Say, Lord, I'm going to worship through this and you're going to lead me to new heights and keep worshiping. Psalm 27, 5 and 6. In the day of trouble, He will hide me in His shelter. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. He will set me upon a high rock. Then my head will be held high above my enemies around me. At his tabernacle, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. We win through worship. There's a number of other passages on the, uh, on the notes. I encourage you to print them out. How about Acts chapter 16? Paul and Silas imprisoned. And what are they doing in there when they're in jail? They're worshiping and they're praying. And God sends an earthquake. Worship will get this wall built. Worship will will build spiritual strength. The Lord will fight for you. The third question that is asked of them, do they think they can do the impossible? He says, can they make these stones that are burnt and smashed, can they bring them back to life? Can they bring them back to life and breathe life on them again and breathe life into these piles of rubble? Which is kind of a funny, I mean, do they think rocks were alive at one point? I mean, I know it's sort of an analogy, I get it, you know, Shane was on one of the We Carry the Fire podcasts and he was telling a story about when he was riding uh, mountain bikes out in the desert and he got a little distracted and he, I give him a hard time because he says, and I almost hit this rock. He says, it was a rock that hadn't grown into a boulder yet and I just swerved and just missed it. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Did you say a rock that hadn't grown into a boulder yet? Do you think rocks are alive and that they're growing and that little rocks slowly become boulders and then turn into mountains? So if you see Shane... Be like, hey, how are those rocks growing for you? I like to give them a hard time. But they said, do you think these burnt stones can come back to life? And you know, we're going to see a little bit later in our book, not today, but on another day, that these piles of burnt rocks, they, they were pretty enormous. They, they would pose a problem, just all the rubble, just trying to work in the rubble. And there's a whole other message there. 
But these piles of rubble were like intimidating mountains that needed to be moved quite literally. Where would they find the strength where would they find the manpower? Where would they find the resources to gather these rocks and repair what has been so badly smashed and damaged and burnt? There are some areas of our lives where we've been so smashed and damaged and burnt and the enemy would come or maybe even our own psyche would come along and say, do you really think you can do the impossible? Do you really think you can make something of this mess? They assumed the answer would be no. But for Nehemiah, once again, the answer was, yes, we can do the impossible. Do you believe that God can do the impossible in your life? Is there something that you have given up on that's so badly smashed and burned, you say, that could never be rectified, there could never be healing there, but there can be. If you've said that's impossible and I'm giving up on it, I want to encourage you to have faith for that thing again today. Are there huge piles of rubble, of devastation in your life, and you need to turn those piles of rubble into strong walls again. Does it feel like an insurmountable task? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is confidence in what we hope for. And it is assurance of what we do not see. Do you believe that God can do the impossible in your life? Romans 4.17 God who gives life to the dead. There's an impossibility. And calls things which are not as though they were. God does miracles. He does the impossible. We believe that with God, we can do the impossible. And when your own thoughts and your own mind goes to that place where you say, this is impossible, do you really think you can build this into something again? Do you really think you can overcome this? When the enemy comes and says, do you really think you can do the impossible? The assumed answer is no. But you and I both know the answer is a resounding yes. We can do the impossible. You can see God do the impossible in your life. Rebuilding the temple, as I mentioned years earlier, decades before our text, uh, we have Zechariah prophesying over Ezra and Zerubbabel as they go into the same city to rebuild the temple. Now we're looking at Nehemiah building the walls, but here's what he said when they're trying to rebuild the temple in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. You'll recognize the beginning of this. It's not by might. It's not by power but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. What are you, mighty mountain? This is one of those piles of rubble. What are you, mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. In other words, this has been done in the past. Nehemiah is standing there looking at the piles of rubble that once were a wall. And he knows the prophecy of Zechariah about piles of rubble that once were the temple. And in the past, they went out and said, this mountain is going to be level ground. We are going to rebuild. God bless it. God bless it. Verse 8 of that same chapter, Zechariah 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things? In other words, that little brick you pick up, that's a big deal. Little beginnings, that's a big deal. Don't look down on small beginnings. One day sober, don't look down on that. Starting to reconnect with a husband or with a wife, don't look down on that. Re rebuilding these walls means celebrating the days of small beginnings. He goes on, since the seven eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. You see, Nehemiah knew that Zerubbabel and Ezra had already succeeded in very similar circumstances long, not that long ago. God's word was true for them then. It would be true for Nehemiah in his day. And it is true for you and I in our day today. Do you have big piles of rubble and ash? God can and will move it. And you can build spiritual strength. But don't despise the day of small beginnings. Do you think you can do the impossible? Yes, I do. Say it right now. Do you think you can build the impossible? Say, yes, I do. I do think God in me can do the impossible. Amen. So here's the three questions so far that have backfired for our benefit. Number one, do you think you can build strength with all of these enemies around? Yes, we do. Do you think that? Yes, we absolutely do. 
do you think your worship will get this wall built? Yes, we do. Do you think you can do the impossible? Yes, yes again. Yes, we do believe that with God we can and will do the impossible. And the last question, Matthew, you know, Matthew 19, 26, with God all things are possible, right? Yes. And the last one, then the bonus round. We see this actually in verse 3. We didn't read it yet. Here's the question. Do they think they have what it takes? Do you think you have what it takes to build spiritual strength? Here's where we get this one from Toby, verse 3. Then Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was beside him. So he chimes in. Sandy's been barking the first three. And then Toby feels like, I better say something. And so he says this. If even a fox were to climb on what they're building, it would break. Their walls would break down their wall of stones. They don't have what it takes. Even if, let's just say, let's say they get the wall built. A fox will go up on it, it'll all crumble down. They don't have what it takes. They don't know what they're doing. Even if they build it, it'll fall so fast and so easily. They don't know what they're doing. It won't last. You ever had those types of questions? Even if you make some progress, it won't last. Even if you build it, you don't have what it takes. It's all going to fall apart. Do you think you have what it takes, Nehemiah? They assumed the answer would be no. But the answer from Nehemiah, again, a resounding, yes, we do have what it takes. Church, do you have what it takes? Christian, do you have what it takes to build spiritual strength? And some may challenge whether you can sustain your success or not. You may have doubts of your own whether you can sustain the spiritual strength and build or not. Will the things that you build stand? Will the habits that you break return? Can you do it? Do you think you have what it takes? And I want you to say yes I have what it takes. I have the Spirit of God within me. I have Jesus walking with me every step of the way. I have the power of the church, the keys of the kingdom. They are mine, and I do have what it takes. That question backfired big time. Do they have what it takes? You know, I heard a story right about this time of year, Thanksgiving time. A man, he had, in his young 20s, developed an addiction to alcohol himself, and it was right at the time he'd gotten married and had a daughter, and then after a few years of alcoholism, he, he, he finally, through one of these celebrate recoveries, he, he got some help and he, he broke that addiction. And for a few years, he had been sober, hadn't had a drink in years. His father was a drunk. His father was a mean drunk. The little girl, his daughter's grandpa, was a mean drunk. And because of that, he would only go see him once a year. He would call him once or twice a month, but he'd only go see him once a year right around Thanksgiving, either the day before maybe a couple hours on Thanksgiving, a couple hours drive, he'd spend a couple hours with him and then drive back. He didn't see him very often, but he'd always make sure he saw him right around the Thanksgiving time. And he'd kind of let his wife off the hook because he was, the grandpa was so mean that, that the young man would say, you know, honey, you can find an excuse. That's cool. I'll go see my dad. And, and the little girl would go see her grandpa. And so dad and daughter went to see grandpa. And as they got there, he said, yeah, come on in, come on in, good to see you. They hug and they shake hands. And as they're talking, Grandpa goes and he pours a uh, whiskey and he pours another one and he slides it across the table for his son. And his son slides it back to his dad. He says, Dad, you know I don't drink anymore. Oh, yeah, you're still doing that. You still think you're better than me. You, think, you really think you could do it. You're, uh, you're still on to this nonsense and he's kind of mumbling. He says, Dad, I, you know, you know I, I love you, but uh, you know that I, I can't drink that. I've gotten clean, I've gotten sober, it's important that I stay that way. And the grandpa said this, you'll be drinking just like me in no time. You watch, you'll be just like me in no time. And at that, the young man started choking up and didn't quite know how to respond, just really hurt, broken inside, just the dad just stuck him through the heart. You, you'll be drinking like me in no time, you just wait and see. Little girls sometimes say the sweetest thing, she saw her dad choking back tears. And the little girl said, Grandpa, you said the same thing to my daddy last year. And the dad looked at his little girl and thought, you know what, he did. And I'm still here. I'm still clean and sober. I do have what it takes. My little girl believes in me. She spoke up for me. They tried to enjoy the rest of their time together, but the point being, even that little girl said, Grandpa, you said the same thing last year. You doubted him last year. You put him down last year. And I watched my dad go 365 days showing that he has 
what it takes. And you and I, we do have what it takes. And where we fall short and in our weaknesses, that's where the Spirit of God comes and takes over. The Scripture says in our weakness, that's when we are strong because we lean on Jesus. That He is going to get us across that finish line. We do have what it takes. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you should meditate on it day and night so that you will be careful to do everything that is written in it. For then He will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. When you're walking by the Word of God, you do have what it takes. He will give you good success. How about Psalm 37, 23 through 25? The steps of a man are ordered by the Lord who takes delight in his journey. Though he stumbles, he will not fall. For the Lord is holding his hand. You may stumble, but the Lord is going to grab you before you fall. You do have what it takes. That text goes on. David says, I once was a young man and now I'm an old man. Yet I've never seen the righteous abandoned nor their children begging for bread. And then we couldn't go through this one without Philippians 1.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you think you have what it takes? <laughs> yes, I do. I do think I have what it takes. Do you think you can build with all of these enemies and all this opposition around you? Do you think you can grow strong with all of us here? Yes, I do. Believe it today. Yes, I can. Do you think your worship is going to get you past all these problems? As a matter of fact, yes, I do. Do you think that you can do the impossible? Yes. Yes, church, we can do the impossible. Questions that backfire for our benefit. And then lastly, that bonus round that I told you about. Let's read a little bit more in Nehemiah chapter 4, and then I'm just going to leave you with a thought. Chapter 4, verse 4. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. So this is Nehemiah's response. Turn their scorn back on their own heads. Let them be taken into plunder and to a land of captivity. Do not cover up their iniquity. Let their sin be not blotted from your sight, for they have provoked our builders. Chapter, uh, then verse 6, so we rebuilt the wall until it was joined together up to half of its height, for the people had a mind to work. With all these threats and all these questions, Nehemiah did two things. And here's our two things. God, you deal with the enemy. Lord, if our enemy needs to be torn down, you tear him down. I'm going to keep building up. We built the wall quickly up to half its height. Why? We had a mind to build. We had a focus not to argue, not to try to prove ourselves right, not to try to prove the other side wrong. We had a mind to build these walls. Lord, you tear the enemy down, we will build up our wall. You tear the enemy down, we will build spiritual strength. You can build spiritual strength with enemies surrounding. You can worship in order to win. You can do the impossible. You do have what it takes. But we need to have a perspective like that of Nehemiah. I will keep building up and I'll leave it to the Lord to tear down. If we get involved in tearing things down, we're not building things up. You and I focus and hone in and say, Lord, all of the attacks of the enemy, all of the questions coming at me, Lord, you turn the scorn upon their heads. You let them be taken away on your timetable. You take my enemy away. You remove the opposition. When you see fit, what I'm going to do is just put another brick on the pile. And I'm going to put another brick on the pile. And I'm going to help my brother put another brick on his pile. I'm going to help my sister put another brick on her pile. Questions that backfire. Yes, we will build, even though there's enemies all around. Yes, we will worship to get the win. Yes, we can do the impossible. And yes, we do have what it takes. Let God tear down and you keep on building up. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this awesome, inspirational passage. As each one of us seeks to build spiritual strength in our lives, Lord, help us to be reminded every day that life is not perfect, that many times it feels like the enemies are closing in on us, but that we can build spiritual strength even in a hostile environment, that we can and should worship to find the victory, that we can, through you and your spirit, see the miraculous and the impossible take place. And Lord, instill confidence in each one of us 
that by your grace, we do have what it takes. Father, let we, your church, be people who keep building up and let you take care of the rest. Thank you, Jesus, for this powerful word. May your people be blessed, encouraged, and inspired today. In Jesus' name, amen.
your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. 